All right, folks, welcome back. Uh, we're now live. And uh, Joseph, if you don't mind introducing our next speaker. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Omar. So I'd like to uh, thank everybody for attending uh, Hacking is Not a Crime, the HackerCon, a joint uh, presentation from uh, the Red Team Village and Hacking is Not a Crime. Um, our next speaker is Sean Wright. Uh, it gives me a great honor to be able to announce and announce him and his talk. Uh, Sean is a lead application security SME at Immersive Labs with an origin as a software developer, primarily focuses on web-based uh, application security with a special interest in TLS-related uh, subjects, experienced in providing technical leadership in relation to application security, as well as engaging with the team to improve the security of systems that they develop. Uh, he's passionate uh, to be part of the community and giving back to the community, um, which he's doing here. Um, and also, if you don't know, he is a proud member of uh, the at the Beer Farmers. So without further ado, uh, here is Sean Wright. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Um, and thank you for having me. Um, amazing event, amazing talks that have been lined up and uh, still to come, as well as those who have given talks, um, some really interesting topics. Um, so yeah, uh, just a bit about myself. Um, so as mentioned, I was a member of the Beer Farmers. Uh, we're just a small group trying to um, improve security through the community in a fun way. Um, I also do some research. So want to be a hacker. I wouldn't say I'm exceptionally good at it. I try as I can, um, but I enjoy doing it. And then you can also follow me on uh, Twitter. Um, I'd also like to say a big thanks to all those who have organized the event, as well as all the speakers. Um, so hacking is not a crime, as well as uh, Rare Team Village. Thanks for putting this event on. I, I really um, enjoy it, and I think it's really worthwhile. So having a look at the what this talk's about. So I'm going to cover my kind of perception of responsible disclosure, some of the processes that I've gone through um, and as the title suggests, a lot of the frustrations along the way, but then also looking at some of the, the joys that you can gain out of it. So I think it's important to um, cover what responsible disclosure is. Um, so this is a, a bit taken from Wikipedia. I know Wikipedia is probably not always the best source to re, uh, reference, but I think it does cover what responsible disclosure is. Ultimately, you're looking to um, disclose the vulnerability in a way that's going to protect the users at the end of the day. That's what I look to responsible disclosure. It's, it's going about it in a responsible, ethical manner. So if you're finding something, you're not just running off to Twitter and suddenly disclosing it. Um, at the same time, I will cover this a bit later, I do think there's a bit of a, a miss in responsible disclosure, mostly from an organizational point of view. Um, so one of the things that you'll see some uh, sometimes responsible disclosure referred to as is coordinated dis uh, disclosure. And that obviously means both sides work to co uh, coordinate and uh, release the information about the vulnerability. And often that's not always the case. Um, so this was me when I first uh, found my first vulnerability and I'm thinking, great, I'm going to go to the company and tell them about it. I'm going to get like thank yous and everyone's going to be happy. And yeah, um, except for the reality is often very different from that. Um, and I'll go into the details further on the slides, um, what actually really happens some, quite often, um, I find. So I'd like to break this down into the four, what you could refer to as frustrations of of uh, responsible disclosure, but there are some more likely steps that I follow um, or I have to go through when I disclose something. So obviously the first one is you find a vulnerability and you're like, great, um, let's go shout to the board, um, except for you shouldn't, um, especially if you're following responsible disclosure. The whole point is trying to get the vulnerability fixed before any information is uh, made public about that vulnerability. So it may be great to get really excited about it. I've been down this 
road several times. You want to shout from the rooftop and shout to the world that, hey, I found this vulnerability. Look how cool it is. Um, but yeah, you've got to be patient. Um, next one is trying to get contact. And this is sometimes the hardest part. Um, so you found the vulnerability, you know the company. Now you're going to have to try get someone to be able to handle the information that you give them regarding the vulnerability. And this is often very, very difficult. Depending on the companies that you're dealing with, some companies are obviously very great at this, but many times it's very difficult to even find a email address or uh, a simple contact person just to pass on the information and kind of get that foot in the door so they can work with them um, to deal with the disclosure. So out of this, I've come to some tips that I've seen along the way. So security.txt is a really useful resource. Unfortunately, not many companies are following this. For those who don't know, it's a resource that you would primarily put on your um, public website. Um, and it's in well known forward slash security.txt. And that should contain all the contact information that anyone that needs to disclose a security vulnerability or incident to your company, they can get in contact with those contact details there. It can be an email address, could be a phone number. Um, so I highly recommend companies look at doing that. The other thing you could do is try to start looking for the, like doing a, like a Google search and look for company plus the word security. You might find they have a security email address or contact section on the website that's not, maybe not always easy to find. Um, doing a, a web search should hopefully help with that. The other thing that you could try is ask on social media. Um, so put out a tweet saying, hey, um, does anyone know um, anyone that can get, get in contact um, to try disclose or disclose something to them. Obviously don't give them details or don't tweet out details about the vulnerability. Just say a security issue or something like that. This one is actually a, a tip that was given to me um, and I never thought about it. So sometimes you may not even win via the first three methods. Another way is go to something like LinkedIn. LinkedIn's really good because put, people put their job descriptions down on LinkedIn. So you can try search for the company and find any security um, folk in that company, um, even their CISO, and try message them directly if you're not uh, wanting to find another means. Um, and often that can have really good results, especially if you are um, engaging with managers and higher managers such as CISOs or directors, um, they would likely try avoid any sort of negative um, press that comes out of it. So hopefully they'll take on the um, vulnerability disclosure uh, with the, um, sorry, uh, the, they will hopefully take it on board. Um, the other way that you could do it is also contact their support. So I've gone down this route uh, several times before. Again, you can try email the support. So if they've got like a support email address or even on social media, they sometimes have uh, like support Twitter accounts, you can try to contact those and try to get information. And at least they can then pass on the information and get someone in contact with yourself. And this one, I have don't do it often. I think I've only done it once. Um, and it actually was really successful. So not getting in contact with reporters to disclose the vulnerability and write up and make it public, but they often have contacts or leverage that they can uh, gain. And in fact, in my case, I worked with a reporter and I actually helped get a vulnerability fixed that was there for several years. Um, so sometimes working with reporters can really help. Obviously, making sure that they don't report about it until the vulnerability is actually fixed. So moving on to the next stage. So you all often find that this is what happens. Um, you get in contact and then nothing. Or in some cases, as you can see, uh, you get in contact, you get a, a, some sort of initial conversation going, and then it's suddenly silence. Um, and that can be really frustrating because you don't know if they've actually fixed the issue. Um, you don't know where it sits. And yeah, and you really want to start uh, making sure that the issue is fixed. 
And then at other times, the issue can just magically resolve itself with no contact whatsoever. Um, so I've had this before. You get in touch with the vendor, you let them know about the vulnerability, absolutely no communication back to you, but magically the, the issue is fixed. And then unfortunately, in some cases, thankfully this is rare, um, legal cases can arise. Uh, we've seen that several times and some of the talks today kind of touched on this. Um, thankfully, it's not often that this happens, but it is unfortunate that it happens. And then in even more rare circumstances, physical violence has occurred. Um, there was one case where a researcher actually got physically assaulted at one of the events um, that they were trying to follow this person to uh, get the disclosure seen to. But as I said, it's not all bad news. Sometimes things can go right. Um, and sometimes the, the responsible disclosure can actually be an absolute joy to work with. So this was one for me, it was an absolute highlight. If you look at that timeline there, in less than two weeks, they fixed multiple vulnerabilities. And not only that, they, they fixed those with coming to myself to vet the fixes. And that's the way I view like an ideal scenario of responsible disclosure working. You get the recognition or the respect, they get to fix it and their customers or users are protected. And in a short time period, that's like fantastic. That's to me, sets a shining example of what responsible disclosure should be and how it should work. And then obviously once that's all covered, so they fix the vulnerability um, and you, they're happy with, also important is work with them um, to make sure that they're happy that you're not giving any false information and then you can disclose the vulnerability and make it public. So I've covered a lot of um, information in terms of processes that I've been through and scenarios that I've been through. But along the way, I've learned many things. So some of the things I've learned away, along the way is you're going to have to learn to have a lot of patience. Sometimes these vulnerabilities um, can take months, sometimes even a year or longer to disclose, um, depending on the severity of the vulnerability. Uh, you probably don't, if it's a very severe vulnerability, it's probably better to not disclose that until it's actually been fixed. Um, but again, that's something you probably need to work with the vendor. And that's something that's going to be a decision you're going to perhaps have to make one day if the vendor doesn't uh, engage with you or simply unwilling to fix it. Um, and along with this, it's very easy to get excited. It's very easy to try um, give tidbits here and there or maybe tell your friends or, or something like that. Um, and then it get leaked out. Um, so I'm not saying be totally secretive about it, um, but make sure that you don't give information unnecessarily and it can get leaked out. This is also a big one. And I've seen it from the side of a company receiving these is if you want to get money from a disclosure, join a bug bounty program. Don't expect to get money if you're um, doing independent security research out of these programs. You may sometimes get it, but don't be uh, the one going and asking for it. Uh, we had a scenario where someone was actually kind of, uh, in a sense, blackmailing us, um, saying they would only give us details about the vulnerability if we paid them. That's not the right way to go about it. Make sure that you're fully aware that you need to give up all the information up front, and hopefully they'll give you something in, in return, but don't expect it. Um, it can often be discouraging when you're going through a lot of these frustrations. So make sure that you also focus on the, the positives, and especially at the end. What, what, what is it that you're actually doing? Why are you doing it? Um, I'm assuming that if you're not in a bug bounty program, you're doing it for a, a greater cause. So money shouldn't be your driving factor. Other things. Try to obtain a CVE. So we saw John earlier today talking about the process of going through a CVE. To me, CVEs are really important for multiple reasons. One, it's something that's associated with your name. And I know there's a constant debate of, oh, you shouldn't have CVEs um, to boast about and that. And I entirely agree. 
but there are still something that's official that you can tie to your name. Um, and this is perhaps for me more important, CVEs go into a central database. Um, so the, the National Vulnerability Database. And while it's not great, it is still better than not having it in there. So information about that vulnerability is now in a resource that is shared uh, across multiple organizations and multiple tools. Multiple tools make good use of that uh, database. So to me, that's probably one of the biggest reasons why you want the CVE. Another thing you want to do is make sure you document and share details about it. Obviously, once it's been fixed and once you do the disclosure, but go into as much detail as you can. The reason being is you want others to learn from this and don't repeat the same mistakes. So it's a really useful learning tool um, for others to go off and try to search, like for example, for example, if you find a cross-site scripting vulnerability in a unique way. Um, if it's well documented, then others can learn from that and prevent that same uh, mistake happening again. And to protect yourself, what I try to do as much as possible is document the timeline um, to show that I, from my perspective, I've done everything that I can, um, especially if they're not coming back with any communication. I've done everything that I can um, to engage with the, the organization and I eventually was basically forced no option but to disclose. Um, of course, do this legally, make sure you don't step any legal bounds. Um, so this one can always be tricky. Uh, typically when I'm doing research, I make sure I stick to my own network and devices on my own network. Um, generally that's a better way for me to go about it because it's my network. So I generally should be okay. There may be some caveats to that, but also don't go off to organizations internet facing service and start delving into that if you don't have authority to do that. Um, if you want to start doing that, look to bug bounty programs again, and that they'll set scopes and that kind of thing that you can do that. Um, obviously, you disclose with the company and organization that have the vulnerability, work with the company, um, do that coordinated disclosure, um, make sure they're happy with your disclosure if they have been engaged with yourself. One of the things I've seen often around vulnerabilities, and it really frustrates me because I've been on the other side where we have to fix a vulnerability and it's not always as simple as it sounds. Um, have guidelines by all means. So like 90 days or 72 days or whatever, but realize that organizations have a, a lot of things going on. Um, and this is an excuse, but sometimes also fixes may not be as simple as you think. So as long as the organization's engaging and communicating with you, try to be flexible. Don't just go, oh, it's 90 days. I'm just going to disclose regardless of any sort of um, arguments from the company. Work with the company. At the end of the day, you're trying to uh, protect the user. So the user should be the one inside, not you or the company. Be polite. Um, there's no need to get nasty or in some cases, I've already mentioned blackmail companies and that kind of thing. Um, being polite means you're the better person, even if they aren't polite themselves. Um, and it just means that you stand the higher ground as well if things do get nasty. And lastly, have fun. Um, even though I don't do a lot of security research, I do enjoy going down the rabbit hole. Um, it's, it's why we do what we do. Um, yeah. So that was from a security researcher perspective. Now, from a company perspective, there's, there's a few things that I think organizations can do. And this kind of comes to my point, which I mentioned at the beginning, the coordinated disclosure process. So some of the things companies can do is security.txt. Uh, have that on your website. That's a really useful tool for researchers. Because that means they can just go to a single location, know who to contact, and get the process underway. You have to realize that these researchers are often doing it on their own time, own resources. They have families, they have friends. So they take an effort to help your organization out. The least you can do is just make things a bit simpler for them. And along with this, have a process. So some of the vulnerabilities that I've disclosed, 
The reason why they just got ignored is because there was no process for handling them. So my communication just simply got lost. So make sure you have processes for tracking these vulnerabilities that have been disclosed to you. And again, coordinate it. So be respectful, as much as you expect the researcher or the reporter to be polite, be polite yourself, um, conduct your organization, um, so be professional about it. The other thing is be thankful. Thank you can go a long way. Um, I think I can count on the number of fingers on my hands how many times I've actually been thanked for disclosing things. And as I mentioned, researchers spend a lot of their own free time, their own resources doing this. You often pay thousands for the amount of work that they're doing. So the least you can do is just a simple email or something saying, you know what, thank you for bringing this. This is really useful. Um, we appreciate the work that you do. Not just ignore them or even worse, send them legal threats. That's not how you thank someone. And to that collaboration, work with the researcher. At the end of the day, it's protecting your users. It's not about you. It's not about the researchers, it's about your users of your systems. So working with your researchers, uh, making sure that it's, um, the fixes in place appropriately fixed. This is another thing that happens is sometimes you may fix the vulnerability, but it may not be appropriate fix. Get the researcher or uh, the reporter to test the vulnerability uh, fix or review the fix. Um, you may not have the, you will, sometimes if it's a sensitive internal system, that may not always be quite the case, but maybe float some ideas past them or get your own internal security team to um, verify the fix. And perhaps most importantly, don't view this as a personal attack. This is, we all make mistakes. No one's perfect. No system's unhackable. There are plenty of vulnerabilities and probably systems that I've written over the years. It's about protecting your users and someone reporting a vulnerability to your organization isn't about them trying to attack your um, organization. In fact, it's them trying to help your organization. So don't view this as a personal attack. So um, besides the successful enjoys of um, disclosure, which don't have, seem to happen um, often, why would you bother about this? Well, for me, these are the points that kind of highlight it for me. Uh, so it's really important. It's helping the users. It's the right thing to do, both from a technical point of view, you're getting something fixed, as well as morally. You, you're trying to go about it the right way. You're trying to follow the process. And we've literally in the conference where there's a community called Hacking is Not the Crime, we are trying to change the perception that hackers are bad. That's Hackers aren't bad. Hackers just do things. There's good and bad hackers. So we, by following this process, we can hopefully change the perception that all hackers are bad. Um, and that kind of goes towards the, the positive relationships, building relationships with companies. Perhaps one of the reasons why I think it's a personal attack because of this misconception, are oh, they just hackers, they're bad people. Um, without realizing that these are people trying to help and uh, have the best intentions at play. Um, and also, as we've seen recently, zero days are becoming increasingly targeted. From our view, I could be entirely wrong, but just the beginning of the year, we, we've seen many zero days. We've got the exchange service. Uh, there's a recent IRS uh, vulnerability in WebKit. Um, attackers are starting to use zero days more and more. So trying to make sure that these things are fixed before any information gets out just helps users at the end of the day. Um, and then it can also be rewarding. So not maybe monetary wise, but it's something that you can include on your re resume. So one day, if you're looking for a pen testing job and then you can go, great, look at all these vulnerabilities I found and someone can actually go through the details. So from a technical point of view, they can see that you're great from a technical point of view, but also not just from a technical point of view, but from a personal point of view. How do you work with organizations? How do you work with other people? That's also really important. It's a soft skill that you can then demonstrate by a, such as the things that I said, your disclosure process. 
And finally, as I mentioned, it, it helps with the message so that we're trying to create. Um, trying to forge this notion that not all hackers are bad, that we are trying to do the right thing, um, that we are trying to improve things for organizations. And lastly, make sure you have fun um, and go, go out there and find more vulnerabilities and protect the users. And yeah, thanks for, for listening and thanks for everyone putting this event on. It was fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Sean, and thank you everybody for joining as well. Thank you for your support for both hacking is not a crime and, and of course the community. Uh, we're going to go in a quick break. Uh, please follow the conversation in Discord. The link is in the bottom of the screen, as well as all the links to the websites, of course, and the schedule in the description, both in YouTube and in Twitch. So once again, Sean, thank you again for your time today and thank you for collaborating with us. And again, we're going to go in a break. Thanks. Thanks.